Are we live? I see the live button. We, I am on, Dave. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is um, my, oh, my name is Dave Q. I'm the Senior Community Programs Manager at Asian Arts Initiative. And then I'm here with Isaac. Isaac, you want to say hi? Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so we are here for the mural, Mommy, Where Do Murals Come From tour. Uh, I just learned yesterday that the joke title that I sent in, the, the placeholder that was uh, before I sent in my series title became the actual title. Um, so welcome. Welcome to this tour. I, we're, first, we're going to talk about um, so a mural kit that you may have ordered. I'll tell you what's in it. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes talking to Isaac Lin, a special guest artist and past collaborator of Asian Arts Initiative. And then I'm going to take you through a virtual tour of um, our neighborhood, Chinatown and Chinatown North, talking about the murals uh, that are in our neighborhood, but also where they came from, how they came to be, and what they symbolize and they mean. Um, so let's start with the mural kits. I was We're a little late, I apologize, but I was actually out at the mailbox looking for my mural kit. I had ordered one as well, but it didn't arrive. So I can tell you what's in it, but unfortunately I can't show you what's in it. Um, some of you may have ordered a mural kit. Uh, make your own mural kit. It's going to include a 16 by 20 inch canvas, uh, and all of that is going to be color coded. So essentially anybody should be able to go in and uh, paint it. You just uh, there, there are going to be colors that correspond to either numbers or colors that are on the painting itself. And you just use the colors to fill in the painting accordingly and you should end up with a really cool image. This is how a lot of murals are done these days, especially if you're working in Philadelphia. Um, we've pioneered a technique here where we paint on sheets um, and then those sheets get installed on the walls. And in order to kind of involve uh, more community members, we ask the artists to do this kind of color coding paint by number system so that people in the neighborhood can come help out with the painting uh, and eventually be able to say, hey, I paint that mural on the wall, I helped paint that. It's a ton of work for the artists. Uh, not every artist is happy when we ask them to produce murals this way, but it's uh, invaluable. It's an invaluable process that allows everyday people to come in and be a part of that painting process. Um, so if you have a mural kit, please feel free to open it up, explore and paint as we're going through this uh, little little tour here. If not, it should arrive in the mail soon. I hope mine arrives in the mail soon so I can paint it as well. Um, and just follow the instructions in the kit and you should have yourself a really cool image. So I'm going to bring in uh, artist Isaac Lin, a past collaborator of Asian Arts Initiative and a, an artist living here in Philadelphia. So hi, Isaac. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your art practice? Hi. Sure. Um, so I'm a first generation uh, ABC, American born Chinese. Um, my uh, father was born in Shanghai and uh, his family came to Philadelphia um, when he was 16. Cool. And my parents cool. met in Chinatown, Philadelphia and got married in Philadelphia. Um, I uh, probably the only well in my family I'm the only one that went to art school um I'm uh what else um I'm a husband um my wife and I are collaborating on a clothing line um but uh yeah I don't know I like being in Philadelphia uh, I'm in my cool. studio oh, right now about that. um and my my uh, yeah. Tell us about your art practice, was, uh, or tell us about the paintings behind my you. My art practice, my painting practice, right? Um, sure. Uh, well, these paintings are for um, a solo show uh, coming up at my gallery, Fleischer Ullman Gallery, uh, here in Philadelphia. Um, I guess my work uh, has changed a lot, like the. The mural that you're going to show is more, you know, figurative and um, like cartoony animals. And that's like one side of my practice. And my other kind of work is this, these more abstract pieces um, that the style that I've kind of um, been developing since graduate school. I went to graduate school at uh, California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Um, I went to Rhode Island School of Design for undergrad for painting. Um, 
but yeah, my painting practice is right now it's very sort of methodical and meditative for me. It's like right now, especially during the pandemic and the quarantine, it's been very um, uh, useful for unplugging and just kind of like a daily practice to uh, sure. right like de-stress. <laughs> um, tell me more about, uh, so I guess your, you, said, you mentioned you were collaborating with your wife on a clothing line. Tell me more about that. So she went to school for, her name is Melissa Choi. Um, so our clothing line is Choi Lin. Um, she went to school for fashion. And so she makes all the clothes designs, like the shapes and the, and, you know, cuts out all the patterns and sews everything together. And then um, we use my designs, like my paintings or, my characters um as like graphics and so yeah that's yeah we've only done a couple pieces it's been about a year um but yeah we want to make some more things it's fun cool. to right on like, collaborate um and make some we were having things. a discussion early on about your work and your practice and i put you in the category of street artist uh, and you actually, you corrected me. You said, I, you, I can see how you would put me in that category, but I'm not a street artist. I'm, I didn't press you then, but I am fascinated by that distinction. So what's the, what's the difference and why are you not a street artist? <laughs> well, I guess I would have to ask, like, what do you Let's consider? Let's see. I think, um, art or I think you artist? ooze style in your paintings, both personally and in your paintings and your work. I see you doing a lot of murals around Philadelphia. In fact, you were, we were trying to get you um, today broadcasting from a mural that you're working on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, yeah, there's just this, I, I would put you stylistically in that category of having really accessible, fun, col bright and colorful work uh, that, that is right alongside street art. Mm. Okay. Yeah, like, I don't know, I, whenever I think of or hear the term street artist, I think of like um, Shepard Ferry, who um, who was at RISD, like a couple, like maybe four years before I uh, got there. And he did a lot of like wheat pasting and um, kind mm -hmm. of like um, political sort of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, and then I feel like there's a distinction in my mind between like street art and like graffiti. Like I don't, I can see like there's overlapping um, like uh, qualities or overlapping um, styles, I guess. But I feel like graffiti has a different sort of mentality. Um, and like for me, street art is also in, I feel like more about like being seen or like doing something provocative or um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't really like, I like having a studio practice. I like, I feel like all my, my work to me is more, I guess like meditative and personal. And I like working small and also working big, like on murals. Mm -hmm. But like for me right now, making smaller paintings has been more, I guess, like, yeah. this hermit kind of like kind of practice so like i feel like street art you're like you know i want to be seen like let me, like i'm gonna go out and like do all this stuff and yeah you know gonna blow people's minds and <laughs> whatever but for me i don't know i'm not i maybe just because i'm more introverted and like, yeah i'm more like leave me alone let, let me just like have my corner and <laughs> make my little drawings so but i can see what you mean by like stylistically and uh things like that like colors or whatever everywhere um and and the pop elements of that and your videos your frozen. style with the brushes for a while you were doing applying that style right onto personal photographs is that right
Right, right. Sorry, I missed what you were Just saying. Just that um, was, that your video cut or it was lagging. Go on. It froze. Um, but um, so right, you were saying about like the uh, my line, like paint drawing my lines on on photographs. Um, that came about, I guess. Um, I was like looking through like photos that my father uh, took of like my mom um, when they went on their honeymoon. My dad passed away when I was 17. And so um, having these photos is sort of like this uh, connection that I have, that I, the way that I can connect to him. Um, and then like, since my work, my, these abstract lines are so sort of like, um, you know, non uh, figurative, it was a way for me to like juxtapose like something like photographs are all very, you know, relatable and you can, um, you know, there you can recognize what's going on in them. So having that juxtaposition of like something more alien and um, maybe like for me, like it was a representation of like the subconscious or um, like feelings of like any kind of feelings of like anxiety or, or fear. Sure. Um, so cool. that was like kind of where um, I was coming from. With the I'm going to start our mural tour by pointing, pointing us to the mural that uh, Asian Arts Initiative completed with Isaac Lin, um, Peaceable Kingdom. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about? And while you're talking, I will pull up images of uh, Peaceable Kingdom here. Yeah, sure. Um, so this was the mm -hmm. first mural that I had ever done. And this was during, um, this was back in like 2011. Um, and the used to go to, as a teenager, the Chinese Christian Church and Center. And oh, cool. so, um, they both, both organizations, Asian Arts Initiative and Chinese Christian Church and Center, they were both, they both had like summer, um, you know, summer camp. And so Asian Arts Initiative, and I think both of them approached me to like do a project to do the mural and somehow involve the, the kids in the, the summer camps. And so, um, since I had like a you know personal history with both organizations, like Asian Arts Initiative really helped me out like a lot when after I had graduated from college, and they helped me sort of um, think about my own art practice as something not just for myself but um, a way to uh, I guess involve the community, a greater community. And so this was this opportunity was like a way for me to, I guess, like give back to both um, organizations. Um, CC, uh, Chinese Christian Church and Center, like that's where my father's wow. funeral was. And um, um, so anyway, um, all those uh, animals yeah. um, are individually like painted and cut out of that parachute cloth that uh, you were talking about in those mural kits. So they're actually like collaged up on that wall. Um, they're actually like, even the ones that are like overlapped, they're like completely like that elephant, that blue elephant. Um, yeah, it's like completely painted blue elephant that I just like sort of layered things on top of it. Um, so the way I had the kids help me was, you know, I would um, draw out like the lion ahead of time in my studio. And then um, I would just <laughs> tell them, they were basically all my artist assistants. And I would just tell them, okay, this lion should be red. <laughs> and then the mane yeah. should be like a dark, uh, like a burgundy. And so they would just like, sort of like fill it in for me and then um, and then I had a couple of like older 
uh, kids helped me actually like cut them out and then um, some mural arts as assistants like helped me like paste them up onto the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but it was cool like the, uh, I think people at the Chinese Christian Church and Center, um, they had connections with like a construction company that provided all the scaffolding. Um, and like that playground is all, there's like a basketball court to the right of the, of the mural. And I used to play basketball with like um, during the summer in the summer league. And I met a lot of like, um, you know, kids from Chinatown. And so that was, it was, it was like a, you know, interesting place to, you know, meet right. a different side of Chinatown or to be in a different. Yeah. And especially this is one of the like few the church, like kind of recreation spaces mm -hmm. in that neighborhood, Chinatown you know, the rest of it is like, so heavily developed with restaurants and then um you know residences um above them yeah. that this is one of the few areas of respite what was it like um going back to such a meaningful place to paint your first mural yeah it was a it was a trip like um i don't know like my studio used to be close to Chinatown. It used to be in that, um, just north of Vine Street. So, um, and I used to be in another studio that was right on the south side of, of Chinatown. So being close to Chinatown is always something that I liked, um, you know, just the proximity to other like Asian people um, and cheap food and, <laughs> um, so yeah i think that um it was just an aspect of i guess like learning about my uh identity like um i had a a solo show at the okay. asian arts initiative back in like 20 what was that 2013 or 2014 and um but I, yeah i don't know I was, going back to like the church was like really I don't know, really cool just to, there's still like a lot of the same people working there or. Um, Did any old heads come back to you while you were painting and say like, look, I, you made it. You know, a lot has changed too. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks for, uh, I'm going to give you another sneak at this uh, <laughs> no. on Google I Map. I did see some people like that summer, people were like, uh, the basketball league was happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much, Isaac. Yeah, I mean, you might be excited to know that uh, we're working again with um, the Chinese Christian Church and Center. Um, we, we just uh, finished a, kind of a neighborhood planning process cool. that led to like, um, some improvements. But uh, this year, we are helping to fund um, renovations of that basketball court and playground. Um, just because this is one of the few outlets that this neighborhood has for recreation space. So, you know, uh, we learned that the, the basketball court's a little bit lumpy, hard to play basketball on. So Harry reached out and, uh, we're, we're funding a renovation of that court. And uh, yeah, the, we're, we're, the mural, the mural is going to stay overlooking, uh, overlooking that playground. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Isaac. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We got to get you back in. We got to get you back to Chinatown to make some new work. Yeah, but thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Anytime. All right. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah, let me know if you. All right. Let me know how I can help. Okay. So. Bye. So now I am going to move us through. I'm going to stay in Google Maps a little bit and uh, lead us on a virtual tour of the neighborhood. I won't be walking around, but uh, that that also means you won't have to watch me uh, huffing and puffing as I hoof the neighborhood. Um, so I'm going to move us through Google Maps. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a selection of murals and public artworks in Chinatown North. I'll be talking about the artists and the ideas behind this artwork, but also about the context that they came about in the neighborhood. I think we've learned this year that public art does not show up out of thin air. Uh, these artworks are the results of campaigns by private citizens and public officials, uh, cementing ideas 
um, uh, cementing ideas and their legacies in our public consciousness. So on the tour today, I'll be talking about the motivations and the thinking behind these murals. Uh, so let's walk over from Peaceable Kingdom to Asian Arts Initiative. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. Boom. All right, so we're going to go back out to Spring Street, uh, walk over. Oh, and as we're going through, if you have any questions, um, since I'll be doing the actual kind of walking, walking around the neighborhood, you can send those questions to Wendy. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll pause a couple times for any questions, but Wendy is going to let me know if there's any burning inquiries. Okay. Okay, so we walked over from the mural again, over to 10th Street. This is Chinatown proper. We're walking north. We're walking north. And then we hit the Vine Street Expressway. This is kind of the, the barrier of Chinatown, the northern border of Chinatown. We cross this 12-lane highway to get to our neighborhood, Chinatown North. Um, you can see that this site is, is currently under construction, but now it's the Crane Tower. Um, let's see. We're going to walk west a little bit along the Vine Street Expressway. Hear the lovely highway traffic noises. Smell those lovely exhausts. Uh, scents. There's the Chinese Christian Church and Center, the Vine Street campus. We just came from their main campus on Spring Street. Okay, we're going to keep going. That's the uh, the end of the elevated rail line, part of it which has been turned into a park. But we will revisit the main part of that a little bit later. We're going to keep going. We just passed 12th Street, and here we are. Uh, the building with the green awnings, that is Asian Arts Initiative. All right, and that's where I work. I'm the uh, Senior Community Programs Manager at Asian Arts Initiative. Somehow I've been uh, thinking about and making work in this neighborhood since 2011. Um, so I'm going to be sharing a lot of that context today. Um, we, Asian Arts Initiative, we're a multidisciplinary arts center offering exhibitions, performances, artist residencies, youth workshops, and a community gathering space. All of our activities use art as a vehicle to explore the diverse experiences of all communities, which include Asian Americans. And even though we're meeting virtually today, we'd like to acknowledge that the land that AAI sits on is the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape, called Lenape Hoking. We acknowledge the Lenni Lenape as the original people of this land, and we acknowledge their continuing relationship with this territory. We hope you too will continue to recognize the first peoples of this place. Um, so, like I said, we are in Chinatown North neighborhood. Um, so, not we're, we're because of the highway, we are separated from Chinatown. Uh, and this neighborhood actually has many other names. Uh, other people refer to it as Callow Hill, the Loft District, Trestletown, the Spring Arts District, the Tenderloin, or the Eraserhood. You know, our neighborhood is definitely a contested terrain. And each one of those names represents a constituency, a group of people that are vying to be included in its narrative of development. So we are going to start by talking about the Pearl Street project. So I'm going to switch to the 2D view. I'm going to zoom out. All right. So we see that Vine Street is kind of the front of our building. But if we go back, Pearl Street is the uh, back of our building. This is the alley behind Asian Arts Initiative and where we focused a lot of our programming, just because Vine Street is not a very welcoming space to throw a block party, right? So in 2011, Asian Arts Initiative committed to activating the alleyway behind our building as a vibrant public space. We saw it as a microcosm of our neighborhood. On one end is the Gold Tex Apartments, right? So if we go to 12th Street, there are the Gold Tex Apartments, a luxury loft apartment with each unit starting at $2,000 a month. Um, if we go right to the other side of Pearl Street is the Sunday Breakfast Rescue Mission, a 140-year-old men's homeless shelter offering three meals a day. Um, on this one street, you got the clash of um, the, the the extreme ends of wealth and class right here um, uh, facing Pearl Street together. And we thought if we could transform Pearl Street, we could transform the neighborhood. Um, so essentially what we did from 2013 to 2017, we committed to kind of um, a suite of activities that would bring life, bring activity to Pearl Street. We held block parties, music performances, community meals, cleanups, and artist-led programs, all to activate Pearl Street. Uh, one, such, one such project that I'll highlight today are the street murals by local artist Isa Luka Dirtsanova. So this is one of the murals that Isa Luka completed. This one was in 2016. It's a street mural entitled Fall Wind. Um, and each year, we, we reach out to Isa Luka to basically start, kick off our, our season in Philadelphia. Um, 
over the winter that over, like from November to February to March, it's really hard to get anyone out. We don't really do much arts programming. Then you have spring and fall seasons where everyone's trying to squeeze the majority of their programming. And then in the summer, it can get too hot. So really we have these limited windows of time. So every year around March, April, we would reach out to Isolu to commission a new street mural that would essentially kick off our season. So each year Isolu would submit a design um, would organize a team of neighborhood volunteers to come and paint this design to kick off that season. It was, for us, a highly visible way to show that we love and care for this space and to indicate to the neighbors that this is a beloved public space and you should also contribute to its care. This is muralism led by our, our organization meant to deliberately activate and animate space. Um, although we didn't convene any programs this past year because of the pandemic, you know, we it, in next year, we look forward to opening a new box office that faces Pearl Street and hope by creating regular usage, regular audiences that use this as an entrance to our building, um, that we at AAI and our neighbors will continue to care for the condition of this public space. Um, let's see, any questions at the moment? Okay, so that's the Pearl Street project. And certainly if I keep moving on, if I miss a question and somebody wants me to come back, I, I know way too much. I can talk for too long about all of these things and I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to oblige. So we're gonna go back to the map here and move on from Pearl Street, by Pearl Street, and move over to the rail park, one of the newest developments in our neighborhood. So I'm going east a little bit. I'm gonna hit up 12th Street, go right in between this old shoe factory condo lofts and the Goldtex lofts. All right, split the difference there. Go right past the Caribbean restaurant, Parada Maimon, a favorite, um, and end up here at the rail park. You can see um, here in Google Maps that this is under construction. Um, but uh, happy to report that the construction was completed and the park is now open as of summer 2018. So let's look at some pictures. Um, this is phase one of the rail park. It's just a quarter mile stretch from Callow Hill Street to Broad Street uh, of an of, um, abandoned elevated trestle line that is now that has recently been transformed into a public park. I think the friends, the local neighbors started advocating for this project before the High Line back in 1990, back in the mid 1990s. And it's just taken this long to actually get, you know, both the land, both the buy-in um, and, and raise the funds to turn it into what we see to here today. Um, the full rail park is actually a bigger, even a bigger vision than that. Phase one is just a very small section. Um, and here we can see that in this diagram. Phase one is here from Broad Street to Callow Hill Street. Uh, but the full uh, rail line actually goes from 31st all the way over to 9th Street. Um, it is a three mile stretch that eventually the Friends of the Rail Park do want to transform that entire stretch of land into a park space. Um, and today I'll be focusing on one artwork at the park. Um, this one right here, Cloud Geshen's uh, Corten Steel Story Wall. This is a court, yeah, a Corten Steel Wall that is at the, um, the Noble Street entrance to the park. Um, that highlights this area's reputation as the workshop of the world. You know, in the 18, in the mid, late 1880s, or turn of the century, essentially, was um, the Reading Railroad. That's why we have this abandoned rail infrastructure in our neighborhood. Um, and it was important to have that um, industry here because those rail lines connected our neighborhood to industries out west, specifically Detroit. So we'll see like uh, companies like Baldwin Locomotive um, and really big in the neighborhood were Packard and Bergdahl car showrooms. Um, because of the rail line, we were able to send car parts um, back and forth from Detroit, uh, east to west connection and, and really have an a thriving industry. And because of that, you know, that anchor institution, many other um, industries uh, thrived in, in, in Callow Hill. So this is muralism that is trying to capture and retell his, uh, history. It's a historical artifact in and of itself. My critique of this is that it is also muralism. Okay, so here's the whole, yeah, here's that whole wall here. My critique of this um, installation is that it is also muralism as erasure. 
<clears throat> the workshop of the world era in Callow Hill is roughly 1893 to 1971. That's how long the um, Re Reading Railroad Company was active. And, you know, I can see that while it's appropriate for the architects to celebrate this era of this neighborhood and make a lot of design choices, um, recognizing this era of the neighborhood, Corten Steel certainly is prized for its ability to rust and weather um, in a very nice way that re represents industries. Um, while all of this is appropriate, uh, they fail to these, you know, this piece in particular fails to acknowledge that this time period of the active industry in Callow Hill also overlaps the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, a U.S. law that explicitly excluded Chinese immigrants from becoming U.S. citizens and participating in factory ownership. It's problematic for a park that many think um, is gentrifying the neighborhood to recall histories um, and not acknowledge communities that have been in the park that we continue to want to use the park that otherwise are not going to not feel welcome. Um, in celebrating the white history of the neighborhood, this mural reinforces the erasure of Chinese communities and Chinese labor that built this neighborhood um, and their continued presence here. You know, we are Chinatown North, but Chinatown is just a hop and a skip away as we saw in the, uh, in the walkover. This is the danger of muralism as historical artifact. We must ask ourselves, whose history are you telling and whose history are you ignoring? Um, we are continuing to, Asian Arts Initiative continues to partner with, you know, Rail Park and uh, Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation to do programming that specifically pulls and calls out um, invitations to the Chinese population. We do, you know, um, our annual Lunar New Year event has become really popular. And I think we continue to invest in that type of programming because we think it's very important to make sure that for a neighborhood that desperately needs green spaces, that they know that this green space is accessible for them. But certainly whenever I look at this mural, I see a failed opportunity to address and overcome the erasure that is happening here. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Any questions? All right, awesome. Moving on. How am I doing on time? 237. I am doing great on time. So that means I am going to take a pit stop to a, just a small tour. Uh, I mean, a small mural that I really like, but that is actually just really simple. Okay, so we're going to leave the rail park here, and I'll just point out for posterity. This is where the rail park comes over and hits at ground level. So if you are trying to enter the rail park, you actually need to go um, on 12th Street and then turn over here onto Noble. And that installation by Cloud Geshen, you can see the base of it hiding behind this building. Um, you can see the base of that right here. Okay. So let's walk over back to the street from Noble Street over to 12th. We are going to oh, take a quick pick stop to say hi to the Pico substation, right? Um, the huge massive infrastructure right in the middle of our neighborhood that ensures that there will you know, always be kind of a depressed tax base. Hi, hi, Pico Substation. Um, let's see. All right. Let's move up north on 12th Street. Uh, look at that beautiful lot that could be a community garden, but is currently being used as a parking lot. All right. All right. Okay. Up to Spring Garden Street. I'm going to go east, walk over, walk over. And then take a stop here at Union Transfer. Let's see, and then I'm gonna put us right on the street in front of this mural. Cool. Uh, the sometimes murals can be really simple. This mural was painted in 2010 by local artist Sean Gallagher. The phrase, it was all a dream, uh, is a line from a, the notorious B.I.G. song, Juicy. And the mural was commissioned by the folks who purchased the old spaghetti warehouse building. This one that we're seeing in the back used to be a giant restaurant. Um, they purchased that building and they turned it into the music venue Union Transfer. Um, so this is site-specific muralism. I, this is one of the ones where there isn't that much of a political connotation. It is simply denoting how the building is being used. And it also is signaling you know, what is, who, who owns this building and what are the uses here. Um, it is relevant to the intended use and culture of the concert venue. Uh, it's simple. I tend to like it. Uh, so sometimes murals can be simple that way. 
not everything needs this deep read that I'm giving it today. So let's keep moving. All right, I'm going to take us back into 3D view. All right, 11th Street. Here we're going to hit Spring Garden Street. This is the northern border of our neighborhood. Very small neighborhood. Um, but as we know, in cities, we can be kind of crammed together. And these, these kind of larger streets that are more than, at least in Philadelphia, this is what happens. Anytime you have a street that's larger than two to four lanes, right? You're, that's going to be the boundary, a natural boundary for our neighborhood. So Spring Garden, that's where people tend to say uh, Chinatown North or Callow Hill ends. We're going to walk along Spring Garden Street. And okay, here we are. Oops. And we're going to take a look at the Spring Arts District. Um, this is an example of muralism as place making as opposed to place keeping. And I will point out what the difference is there. Okay. So we are here. We have arrived, everyone, at the Spring Arts Outdoor Rotating Gallery where. I'm quoting the press release here, where artists have infused the many untouched walls of this post-industrial neighborhood with boundless imagination. So from left to right, we're looking at four murals, a World Cup by Bill Strobel and Tame Arts, uh, and that's this one here. This one is Urban Explorations by Lauren Cat West. This one is Limpia Limpia by Dennis McNett. And this one is Can We Call This Life by Martha Rich. All of these have been commissioned since 2017. And a couple of these have been, um, I think, you know, these two were uh, in the first round. And then, you know, these two are commissioned later. Let's see if we can get a closer look at Martha Rich's mural. Yeah. Again, these are murals that I like, um, but we need to take a step back and question the context of how we're seeing them and why we're seeing them all kind of so close together. Um, so a little, about, a little bit about the site, a little bit about the owners of this uh, area. In 2015, Arts and Crafts Holdings, a developer, began buying properties in mass in this neighborhood. They transformed these abandoned industrial spaces into creative offices, event venues, and breweries, and breweries, and breweries, three new breweries for our neighborhood. Um, this outdoor rotating gallery is a strategy to commission artworks by exciting local artists to attract press and then essentially build energy um, for the available leasable properties that they were um, con renovating. Uh, the name Spring Arts District was coined by this group. So a neighborhood with many names gets one more name. And just specifically this northwest corner of the neighborhood is now branded as the Spring Arts District. And it's true. These properties were all abandoned before, and I don't advocate for the continued abandonment of property. Um, but now they are quite literally revamped, renamed, and repurposed by the singular vision of these developers. This is the difference between placemaking, uh, which is the invention of space through creative energy, and placekeeping, the recognition of the existing cultural assets, the existing cultural histories, and the people that occupy a space. Uh, all these efforts from the Spring Arts District are meant to bring in a new type of audience to populate, you know, an under, undervalued, uh, underoccupied for sure area of the neighborhood. Um, it gets us to an important question that we rarely ask when we are looking at these type of creative revitalization projects. Who are these improvements for? Too often the implied but unspoken answer here is middle to upper class white audiences. Most of the time we are improving uh, spaces that they are the underlying uh, who that get, that these spaces are being improved for. The more actively we can ask and answer this question, who are these improvements for, the more we can ensure that the diverse design and use of our public art and public spaces will be um, will be accounted for. Okay. Oh, I think I see one question here. Question, if you, question, what would a collaboration between architects and muralists to respect the stories being told look like? Hmm. I think actually between architects and muralists look like. Um, that's a really good question and I can actually answer it with the next stop on the, <laughs> on the tour uh, that we are giving. 
because uh, I do recognize that uh, I I am pointing out a lot of things wrong about the muralism in the public garden in our neighborhood, but that is not the intended purpose here. Um, and I don't intend to be a bummer, so I do want to point out one positive example um, because it certainly can be it certainly can be done, right? But I think the um, impetus is in that you know the subtle nuance between what placemaking is and what placekeeping is, right? Instead of instead of focusing on who are the audiences that are able to come in and pay for these spaces, um, right? So instead of fo solely focusing on placemaking as your goal, instead of fo solely focusing on capital improvements that bring in white audiences, it's about centering other types of audiences and saying, well, who we, we from our perspective, we see that this is an underserved neighborhood that we don't see too often we'll say there's nothing here and we need to come in and, and fix this and save this. Um, we I think we just need to shift that type of thinking, um, developers and architects in specific, in particular, uh, and say like, what, who are the audiences that we're here, even if we don't feel like we're seeing any, who are the audiences that are here and how can we serve them with any of the uh, developments we might bring in? So let me on our next stop actually show us one example of that. Um, it's an example of muralism as kind of, this is placemaking and placekeeping. Uh, but it's also trying to heal a wound um, that is actively in our neighborhood. So I'm going to go here. I'm from the Spring Arts District. I'm going to walk a little bit over on 10th Street and start to walk south, a little closer to Center City. Okay, so I'm going to take us right back here to um, the Vine Street Expressway. And again, we see because this is a three-lane highway, then an eight-lane highway, then another three-lane highway, this is the, effectively the southern border of our neighborhood. Um, and I'm sure if you work in community of color, you may be familiar with these types of developments being close or right bisecting your neighborhood. Um, so many communities of color with their limited political power have these types of infrastructure developments proposed uh, right, right to them uh, and you know, in their language for them. The Vine Street Expressway in Philadelphia uh, began construction in the 1960s and it was only through a series of vocal community uh, leaders uh, rising up and opposing this development that we were able to get the path of the Vine Street Expressway redirected so that it would not require the demolition of Holy Redeemer Catholic Church. Um, this was the foundation of the Save HR movement that became the Save Chinatown movement. Um, while they did still build the Vine Street Expressway, we were are very happy that such an important community center was able to be spared uh, through through the um, through the activism of our of our elders. So this is the 10th Street Plaza right here. It's a little parklet built by the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation to try to reconnect our neighborhood, um, you know, Chinatown North and Chinatown proper to the south, to try to reconnect the neighborhood and address the complaint that crossing the Vine Street Expressway is too dangerous. Too many, too many of our neighbors, you know, aren't willing to make make this crossing because it is, it's loud, it's unpleasant, it's hot, um, and yeah, you're 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 subject to the sound of cars and only the sound of cars. With Chinatown proper, however, being, you know, at this point uh, fully developed, the growth of our neighborhood depends on our ability to jump Vine Street and expand to the north here. Um, this is one of the reasons that, you know, PCDC focused their crane tower here. Um, we need to be able to, as a community, think about the potential for Chinatown North as, as our next development site. So this park here, the 10th Street Plaza plays an important role. It represents an important bridge for our community, a jump that we're going to have to make if we want to ensure future expansion of the Chinese community here in Philadelphia. So I'm going to point out the mural that we commissioned for this site. So this is a mural commissioned by Asian Arts Initiative and PCDC. Uh, it is titled Koi Pond by Chinese American artist Chen Lin Kai. It was painted in 2019. Um, and you can see it was, we, we liked Chen Lin for his um, connection to Chinatown, for his language ability, and for his ethics as an artist of really wanting to include um, neighbors in the painting process. With the Koi Pond mural, we 
you know, it was specifically asked to be placed here because we want to reconnect Chinatown proper with Chinatown North. Um, koi fish in uh, Chinese culture represents good fortune. Um, and the idea is to bring good fortune to Chinatown. Let's see. And stu yeah, stu again, students and neighbors helped paint this mural and the design that Chenlin put together rep um, encourages children to jump from lily pad to lily pad as they cross the expressway. This is muralism as place making. Surely we are imposing an image um, that has a specific political purpose, right? But it's also place keeping. There's um, a vibrant Chinese community that has been it's divided by the Vine Street Expressway. And this is trying to uh, heal that wound and reconnect the two sides of the neighborhood. Um, we are recognizing a vulnerable community that is often overlooked that is incredibly present here. Um, Chinatown is, um, you know, it, one of the only communities of color in all of in the central district of Philadelphia. So it is important for us to continue to claim that space. And as we saw with the spring arts districts, there are still many properties that are available north of Vine. Um, so that's why Asian Arts Initiative continues to stubbornly call this neighborhood Chinatown North to indicate to outsiders and to insiders that our post-industrial neighborhood too is our space. And that if we have any hope of um, uh, continuing to be uh, present in the future narratives of development, we must claim that space. And yeah. And there's Chen Lin here, the artist with the design. Okay. That concludes my mural tour. Let's see, let's go back to an overview of the neighborhood and then maybe I'll just walk us back to, or I'll zoom us all the way out. Well, I'll go back to 3D because 3D is fun. I'll zoom us all the way out so we can get a whole picture of our neighborhood, Chinatown North right here and Chinatown to the south. And then here's um, Philadelphia City Hall. This is like kind of the center point of Philadelphia. So you get a sense of how centrally located both of these neighborhoods are um, and how many development pressures that we might be subject to because of that location. Um, I'm seeing one more question here. Oh, wait. I was seeing one more question. Okay. What are some ways you've appreciated how artists intentionally center audiences in their work? Audiences. I think that's a great question. Um, artists. Artists have a tension between studio practice and community practice. Not every artist has the ability to invite community members into that, you know, the, the, the special sauce of creativity. Um, because once you have other voices, it, your own voice can be a little confused, but that's why we seek out community artists who are able to kind of share that creative authority. Um, it certainly is, like I mentioned, uh, muralism is actually much easier to complete if the artist comes out and do, does it themselves. You would think having a lot of hands help out and paint that mural with you um, would, would achieve a lot, but actually, you know, the time it takes to um, take a design and to break it up into all those separate colors, um, put a, essentially impose a coding system that anybody will be able to walk up and understand what it is. Uh, that takes a lot of time. Then it takes a lot of time to pre-mix all of the colors. Like, you know, um, one of these murals at the scale that we're working at, you know, you might end up mixing 140 colors um, in advance so that uh, neighbors and community members can walk up, just pick up, you know, color X47, find find a little section that has that area and then be able to just jump right in and paint that section. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of labor involved in pre-mixing colors as well. And then there's a lot of extra equipment um, to bring out on the, you know, on what we call paint days. Um, usually people coming in aren't going to have wardrobes that are so readily acceptable to get paint all over them. So we need to provide uh, protective gear, gloves, uh, our own brushes, ability to clean those brushes, use sometimes booties if we we're painting directly on the ground as Chen Lin was. Um, so that essentially I'm just saying there's a lot of prep work that goes into taking an artwork um, and preparing it so that other people can just walk up and participate in that artwork with you. Um, but that transformation is so important the ability for people in the neighborhood to say, hey, I was a part of painting this. That ownership is so vital um, to the long-term health and acceptance of these murals in public spaces that I really appreciate how artists put in the time 
to really make their practice and make all the training and their education accessible to a wider audience, right? Um, yes, we, yeah, Chenlin, especially Chenlin specifically, is someone who has a master's degree in painting in a Chinese school, um, and then came over here to PAFA and got another master's <laughs> because he knew his his master's degree would not, um, you know, would not transfer. So he's someone who has two MFA degrees, but is still willing to um, and still firmly believes that art should be uh, for the people. Um, should be enjoyed, should be able to be painted by everyday people and does a lot of work to ensure that um, anyone can participate in that making with him. Um, so that is something I really appreciate about artists that um, would take the time to make sure that the community is um, felt, heard, and can participate in work in that way. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, Yeah, what I like to say, thanks for a newfound appreciation for collaborative mur murals. Yeah, absolutely. And what I like to say about public art is, it is when you're looking at public art, um, that was never the artist's first proposal. <laughs> the artist usually puts out a first proposal and then says, um, um, you know, puts it out to whoever the commissioning agencies are and gets a slew of feedback. Um, change this, can we make this a different color? Hey, you didn't incorporate this neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and the, the process should be that way. Public space is something that we all share. Public space is something that is hotly contested. Um, and I think that's something that we're starting to see this year. If we do are not critical of the work that is, um, being commissioned, being put in our public, you know, those those projects have meaning. Those projects get to dictate what is our uh, pub, what are, what are the things that we memorize and recognize uh, going forward. Um, so public art is a difficult process because it should be a difficult process. And artists definitely go through the ringer putting, everything you see is like the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh proposal that the artist has put out there. Um, so that, you know, for me, that generally makes me a little less critical of public art, but certainly, you know, the artists invite that as well. Uh, and we, and you know, this is, this is our public space. These are our cities. We should be able to <laughs> levy that criticism as I have been doing to, on today's tour. We should be able have the right to le levy these criticisms because this is where we and our communities live. Um, are any of your artists doing any murals in K-Town Olney? That's a great question. Um, I'm actually doing a project with the Alney Culture Lab. Um, I'm not a muralist myself, uh, so that's why I speak in such awe, <laughs> such terms of awe when I talk about muralists, but I am trying to put together a project looking at um, uh, Alney. Alney is a neighborhood, it's the Korea town. It's all, all the way on the northern border of Philadelphia. It's where a lot of Korean immigrants settled. Uh, when they uh, immigrated to Philadelphia and there was a thriving business district. It's certainly where I went as a kid to go get um, Korean groceries, to go get my dental work done. All, all of my all of my weekends were spent doing errands in Alney. Um, but I think the thing that I'm interested in there is looking at how uh, mutual aid systems, how economies, immigrants were able to support each other. Um, Koreans immigrants specifically were able to support each other without access to banks and financial institutions uh, and able to kind of build that economy, build that infrastructure of support for one another to, to establish Koreatown in the in the 90s. Um, so I'm trying to think of a project. Uh, I, I was pretty close to establishing a gay um, or otherwise called a SUSU, one of these mutual aid communities in Alni. But after the pandemic, I'm kind of just taking a step back and taking a look at how the economy has been reorganized and shuffled around uh, and hope that, uh, yeah, hope that I can think of something else, uh, another way of delivering mutual aid to that those communities, which has become way more diverse than just the Korean community. I'd encourage anyone to check out the Alni Culture Lab for um, all the artists that are doing projects over the next year. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming on this virtual tour with me. I hope you had fun uh, doing a quick tour on the on Google Maps. Um, I hope you got to see just a, a different way that we can actually look around and visit a neighborhood that isn't necessarily um, walking around by walking around by foot. All right. Thank you, everybody.
All right, Dave, thank you so much for that. And I just want to ask everybody to just please hang on. We're going to have our next panelist join us.